Welcome, audience, to another episode sort of the True Crime Archives and the finale of this volume of The Tyrant Files. I'm your host, CJ Data. And I've put my coffee in the background. My cafe. My cafe. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Now we move on to probably one of the most infamous is South American dictators, Augusto Pinochet. Oh. All right, let's do it. Now, I will tell you the tale of this. This is not so much, uh, you know, like a tale of how he got into his infamous thing of, of power. It's not exactly just a tale of one, but actually a tale of two, which we'll get to in a minute. All right. Okay. All right, let's start. Let's, so oh. let, and also, let's just put it this way. Most people have signs that they'll, that they'll potentially grow to be, you know, like a potentially bad person, such as potentially most serial killers start with hurting animals. That is true, they do. Animals, or apparently from the, when this guy was growing up, there was no sign that he would ever become, come the way he did. All right, let's 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 start out with a little history. August Augusto Pino Pinochet was 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 born Augusto Jose Ramon Pinochet Agarte on November twenty fifth, nineteen fifteen, in Valparaiso. I'm hoping I'm saying that Chile to his. To his fa to his father Augusto Senior, and his his mother mother Evelina. Now his father was a customs customs agent, and and his mom was was a heavily religious his mother mother and I think and I believe she was a stay-at-home type of mom and let's just say and Augusto Pinochet jr. was the oldest out of him and his siblings and let's just say as a kid he was kind of a mommy's boy I uh, well, yeah when most mommy's of boy, daddy's girl you know yep mommy boy and so he let's just say when when his Father moved some of his family down to the countryside. His he he demanded to stay with his mom. Now he grew up pretty much like pretty much like like most of us anywhere in the world today. Well, most places in the world today. He grew up in a middle class family. Okay. Family. He had a. He actually had a very privileged childhood. Didn't go really through any sort of, you know, hardship. Yep. And 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 heck, he even he even went to school in some of the best schools Chile had to offer. Offer. And, but he wasn't a good student. I mean, he was enough to pass. He, he, he was just passable, to say the least, you know? While he did. Pass, at least. Yeah. While he did enjoy art, he did not. And if there was any point he considered being a, being an artist, it didn't last very long. Sounds like one of a dictator. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. He. And let's just say, and all we could say is, it didn't stop, but even despite going to having, which is on the best schools, it didn't stop him from being bullied throughout his childhood. Especially in his teens, he actually had this kind of uh, annoying laugh that he would do that, that the kids would get, that, you know, the other students nicknamed him the donkey because of his laugh. Oh, jeez. So, so after he graduated, he decided he wanted to become a soldier. His father disapproved, but because he wanted his oldest son to become a doctor, as I'm sure some would. 
to me till you become don't talk to me till you become a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he and let's just say, but he wanted to, and his mom was actually in full support of it because if it was a soldier he wanted to be, it was a it was darn well a soldier he would become. And he definitely did. Yeah, but it was a rocky start. His his application Asian to join was rejected twice. Oh jeez, that's not that's not a good track record. Yeah, was was rejected twice, but then and but eventually his persistence paid off and he was accepted. And he spent pretty much which would go off go on to have quite the, you know the the career in the you know in the art in the Chilean armed forces. Horses. Now, and that's where he he came in contact with this with this you know at the time you know socialist settle socialist senator senator who while he was basically while these camps during this whole Red Scare were were keeping communists imprisoning communists. He was a, the the guy who would be known as the doctor. Well, that was the nickname. He would, he actually walked by, not walked by, but saw, but basically came by to the prison camp he was overseeing to see if the communists were being treated well. And let's just say Pinochet was not a fan of this guy and even threatened to shoot him. Yeah, and what's interesting is just how unremarkable this this guy is. Yeah, he he started out pretty unremarkable. Oh yeah, and that never did, did anything. And so, so let's just see. And and now we focus to what ended up being his gateway. His, you know. You know, gateway. What would end up being his rise to power, and probably getting him considered probably one of the most brutal dictators in South America. Oh boy, for for rise to fame or infamy. Now we need to talk about this other guy who's Nick, who was called the Doctor. Okay, who was this guy? This guy was the name of of Sa Salvador Alande. Alande. He was a Now he now these two despite their differences were pretty similar. Similar. They both grew up in middle class families with, you know, like a heavily you know like religious, you know, like mother and and they and they had everything you know now keep in and, and but here's the thing as as a kid he actually what kind of influenced his you know socialist views even was there was this basically italian immigrant who worked as a shoe cobbler or that he that he that apparently they grew up together, but here's the thing. That cobbler was a committed anarchist. Uh, I... While Salvador never, never really, you know, really, you know, like, fell for, you know, like, the charm of anarchism, he, that did make him become a dedicated socialist. In fact, he was one of the founding senators of, you know, you know, the socialist the, the, the socialist this party of Chile which which honestly he was briefly kicked out of his party because his first run for president was so abysmal his campaign was so abysmal but he lost the election twice but the third time must have been a charm seems so because uh, he won because the, he was the first Marxist to be elected, elect, to be democratically elected in in South America, 
Now, there's another thing here with was saying that the CIA... Now, keep in mind, people, this was kind of a different world at this time. Like, time. Like, for example, communists were very looked down upon. Oh, they were. I'm not saying they're still no, not... Even if, even if they were democratically elected, it's like, I, I no, uh, you can't have that. We'd rather have a dictator. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, let's just say it was a completely different, different world, world. I'm not saying that communism is fully accepted, accepted considering, considering, just think about it, how many communist-run nations are still left in this entire world? As far as I know, only one. Actually, there's, there's more than a few. I'm just talking about, you know, like, that identify as communists. Whether they have a more capitalistic society is beside the point. Oh, uh, only like a small handful. China, I think Cuba still went. Well, yeah. North Korea. North Korea, Venezuela. Venezuela, and I think that's about it, actually. Yeah. North Korea be, probably being the most communist out of all of them. Yeah. Anyway, let's just say there was definitely, uh, let's just say, you know, even though he managed to get, to get into office, his presidency was very unpopular. was very unpopular, and let's just say, and pretty much, and pretty much until the day he was thrown out of office, office, it was just a disaster. Now, let's get back to, to the one, to, to what this video is truly about. You might be wonder, what has Augusto Pinochet been doing all this time? Really nothing remarkable. He still was doing what he did in the military. He was still just as unremarkable as he was then. But it wasn't until... Till... Uh, till the, no. the former... The former... Er... The former l leader, or say former head of, you know, the armed forces... Is, is, let's see, what was this guy's name? Um, let's just say, well, who, basically, commander in chief was passed down to him, him from, from who was, who was, who was commander, you know, in chief before him? Said before before him. Um, let's just just give me just give me a just give me a second. Just gonna you know, let me give me a sec second. Oh, it was it was Gust it was Gustavo Gabo Gustavo Lee. He. He handed the position over to him, to him, but let's just say people were a little shocked to say the least, because they're like, oh really, that guy? Gestapo, that sounds like some, uh, uh, guess, did you say Gestapo or Gestavo? Gestavo. Oh, okay, I was like, Gestapo, that, that's something entirely different. <laughs> Gestapo, Ling, Ling, who... Gave it to the handed over the position to Pinochet, and as I said, they're just like, "Really, that guy?" And heck, even Pinochet's own wife didn't even believe the news at first. Yeah, because at that point, wasn't he still pretty unremarkable? Absolutely, and he really hadn't been doing anything. So let's just say, all right. So after you know. He overthrew it and took control. Oh boy, this is where this is going to get fun. Even though there's 
there's less detail to cover here. It is very... Let's just say this guy... I don't even know what to say, you know? I know, that's when he started getting really crazy. Now keep in mind, I do have a fun fact. My dad was in the neighboring country of Argentina. He was down there for whatever reason in the 1980s. And he was in that neighboring country when he was in power. And he had heard the ho some of the horror stories, but it only got got worse as time goes on, according to him. And, then, and of course, according to history. Yep. All right, so after he got into power, let's just say he pretty much went anybody who, who, was left, who was a leftist, who identified as a communist or socialist, you would be killed. Just straight up execution, no mercy. It's just like, ah, oh, execution. And even people who spoke out against him, it resulted in, and this is just after his his rise, his his uh, it resulted in execution of twelve hundred, the thirty two hundred people. Jeez. The inter internment of many as as 80,000, and the tens of thousands were tortured. And he had this one, which is probably what he's most infamous for. Or it was Operation Condor, and that's exactly what it was. He would take these people, have his soldiers take these people out in... out in these helicopters helicopters and then once they got them high enough high enough he would kick them straight out to fall for their deaths that's got to be you also like torture a bunch of people too i just said that oh yeah you did right i just said that and yeah it was definitely so yeah he basically when he got into power he he took every he took full advantage of everything oh yeah he did whatever he wanted to do at that point he was like hey i'm a, i'm a boss now i can do whatever i want and the fact is he pretty much banned democracy and yeah he was he wanted want, he considered himself basically the king of chile and yeah, let's just say there wasn't another democratic election until the 90s. Uh, and this happened back in 1974. Started in 1974. So 20, so 20 years about any elections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if there's only one thing he may have d done right, let's just say beforehand... The Chile's economy was in ruins. Well, he def he restored it. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. He did, if there's one thing that you can give him at least a small bit of credit for is that yeah he brought the economy back from the dead. But whether or not, but the reasons for it being ruined in the in the first place in the beginning are widely disputed. But, yeah, it's definitely all I can just say is that, yeah, this guy was a very brutal dude indeed. And, yeah, he basically, yeah, he basically, basically just kept doing it until finally he was stopped and he was It was, it was to the point where, apparently, even some of them hit of this, and then there was a miracle. There was an absolute miracle that happened. Apparently, apparently his his seventeen year rule was given a legal framework through a controversial nineteen eighties plus. I can't even pronounce that. 
basically it approved a new constitution drafted by a government appointed commission in 1988. Man, it seems like a lot of things happened in 1988. 56% voted against Pinochet continuing as president, which which led uh, to democratic elections for the presiden presidency and Congress pretty much being restored to the point where he basically just even his own comrades say, came in and said, you know, you got to step down now, bro. And he said, and finally, he just, he gave in. And he said he would step down in two years. So, yeah, he stepped down, down in 1990. Although he did con continue to serve as commander-in-chief of the Chile Army until... Until... Until 1998, when he retired and became a senator for for life, in accordance with you know his newly founded 1980 con constitution. However, he was arrested in London after an international warrant was out was issued for his his arre arrests. In connection with all the horrors he committed. And he was pretty much put on house arrest for the rest of his life, right? Pre pretty much, you know, but but yeah, his health was was, you know, failing at this point, to say the least. So he didn't have too much of a life to go on at that point anyway. Yeah, and so so yeah, they placed him under house arrest and by the time Time of his death on December tenth, two thousand six. Two thousand six. I think we, I think, I think we were well into second grade at that point. Yeah. And he's one of the one of a few dictators in history that didn't meet a bloody end. Yeah. And about three hundred criminal charges were still pending, pending, pending against him. For human rights violations, as well as tax evasion and embezzlement, that that, and and also accusations of having corruptly amassed what would be in U.S. currency twenty eight million dollars. Dang, that's a lot. So. So yeah, so yeah, he died, and that pretty much put it the end to this brutal dictator. This is one of those shorter stories that is that is that it's just a person who comes out of nowhere, pretty much unlike Pol Pot and you know King Leopold II in the series. This guy just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah. Because at least the King Leopold was well a king, and Pol Pot still had some social standing. S social standing. He, what was he? He was an unremarkable military military commander. Yep. That's all he was. But yeah. After this. So yeah, it was definitely a. Uh, a, a time to be down there for sure and honestly and unfortunately Chile still has has some bad struggles to this day but but it's but the bet the best thing is, is that this guy is gone and can never and can never terrorize anybody ever again yep he is gone for good just until the next person comes along then what <laughs> yeah and arguably in the South American region, this guy was named probably the most brutal dictator in South America. And honestly, I think the title was well warranted. Oh, yeah. Sure, he doesn't hold a candle to, to, say, to say Hitler, but he could definitely be, you know, in terms of evil, he could be... And brutality, he, he could be compared to him on a smaller scale. But that still doesn't change the fact. Fact of anything. 
Well, everybody, I... Buddy, I really hope you enjoyed this three-parter. It's definitely taken a longer time to make than I originally thought, but... But that's alright, because now... We're going to be back to regular true crime, and and hear us next time when when we cover Frank Abagnale Jr. Catch me if you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good night, Goodbye, audience. Everybody. Audience, I hope. Audience, and, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace out. Peace.